Right, well, um, thank you for the invitation to speak. I'm delighted to have Jerry introducing me because I know his work uh, recording and popularising Koleski's work, which is one of the many important strands in non-orthodox economics which we need to keep alive. And the main person I try to keep alive is Hyman Minsky. And uh, the reason I'm wearing this T-shirt just fairly informally is this is the T-shirt that was part of the reward for people who supported the uh, further development of my Minsky software with a Kickstarter campaign a couple of years ago. So uh, I have a number of spare T-shirts I wear at conferences as a result. Now, of course, we're talking about the, 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 the neoclassical interpretation of why the global economy has come to an apparent halt is what they call secular stagnation. And this is re revising a view of what, what caused the Great Depression that was first expressed back in 1932-33 by, by uh, Alvin Hansen. But I'm taking a statement he makes now in 1939, or the very end of 1938, uh, when he was president of the American Economic Association, talking about the state of the American economy at that time. And what you can see from the, what, the way he expresses himself here is a real sense of despair. They don't know why the economy is stagnating. They don't know why unemployment won't go down. And uh, in, talking about, in talking about it, they said we have a recovery that appears to occur and then die. So in many ways, it's a similar feeling that we can now see turning up in, in modern economic discourse. Now, his explanation of where it came from was what he called external factors. Now, that means things economists can't control. Stuff outside the economy, what engineers do, and what and what uh, men and women do behind closed doors. Because his explanation of why the economy was not growing was slower technological change, which you blame on engineers, and slower population growth, which you blame on parents for not having children in the first place. That was his entire explanation. Okay. There'd been some, for some reason, unknown to economists, something economists can't change. There's been a slowdown in the rate of technological growth in the 1930s, and there were less babies in the 1930s. Hence, there was more unemployment. That was the sort of logic. You can see that I'm not particularly uh, convinced by the argument. Now, when you take a look at when he made that case, he was, he, 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 what he knew of unemployment at the time he spoke was that it was roughly 20% of the population of America. 20% of the workforce was out of a job. Now, that is the profile for unemployment in America from 1920 to 1940. And you can see that over the 1920s, there was a trend for declining unemployment. And in fact, when the crisis began, which is October 1929, the, re the recorded unemployment rate in America was zero. The reason being the way they defined unemployment back then was the number of people who registered as unemployed at the at the unemployment offices in America. These days, of course, we use all sorts of statistical fudges, but the unemployment rate would be higher than they recorded there using our modern definition. But nonetheless, from zero, and as you can see, it simply accelerates from zero to 26%. Now, his first statement of his hypothesis was in 1934, and at that stage, the unemployment rate was 21%, which was huge. Out of nowhere, from zero to 26% as a maximum, and 21% when he first explained it on the basis of slower technological growth and slower population growth. Then you can see that there was a cyclical process by which unemployment got down to being 11%, which is still very bad, but clearly a recovery. And I think in some ways I see that as a parallel to what we've seen happen since the financial crisis back in 2008, that after the initial explosion in unemployment to 2010, certainly in America, as they record the data, there was a declining trend. But then, and of course it was a mystery to Hansen as to why this happened, unemployment exploded again from 11% to 20%. And so there was a sense of despair amongst mainstream economists at that stage. They didn't know why the Great Depression had occurred. They had no explanation for it, apart from blaming engineers and parents. And then they thought it was over, and then it happens again. So his second speech, and I notice here this is in 1939, at that stage, unemployment was 17%. But according to the statistics he knew at the time, he was still thinking it was back at the 20% peak level. 
Now, we basically forecast forward that you're going to see unemployment staying at that level permanently. And of course, this is what happened. So the hypothesis disappeared for obvious reasons. Empirically, it failed completely. Theoretically, there was no real support for it either. The technological change we saw in the 1940s, 50s and 60s was striking. And the population growth as well, the, the end, the, the, the baby boomer generation of whom I'm, well, we're both members of the baby boomer generation. Uh, so there were certainly plenty of them. So engineers were back for inventing again and parents were back having children again and everything was over. Uh, but then, of course, the crisis comes along again. And Larry Summers now is the person who's pushing this hypothesis because it was something that was taught to him in the incredibly important, and not for good reasons, seminar program at MIT run by, what's his name, I've got to remember now, Fisher, Stanley Fisher, because out of that class we got not just Alvin, uh, not just um, uh, Larry Summers, but Paul Krugman, um, Blanchard, and Bernanke, amongst others. So this one small seminar group has influenced the formation of economic theory for the last 20 or 30 years, so the, 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 the neoliberal 40 years. And, and, and Milton Friedman played a role as well, though of course from Chicago. But this MIT school, one thing that, Al, that, uh, that Fisher taught them was Alvin Hansen's hypothesis. So now we're back in another financial crisis, we're back in economic stagnation, and now comes the same explanation again. And now, of course, we're, we're rather more sophisticated. Larry has a new term he's invented to explain the phenomenon. And the term is the is ferrier, which stands for the full employment real interest rate. Now, this, he's just invented this term in the last couple of, well, I think even the last, last year, quite possibly. And in talking about uh, what's happening now, the, the dilemma is the financial crisis is over. It's all behind us. It happened back in 2008. It's all over by 2010. Why do we still have low unemployment and low growth? Because he's saying if a financial crisis <coughs> is like a, a kind of power failure, then you'd expect growth to accelerate after its resolution. So it's all over. Financial crisis, no longer an issue. Uh, and there's no problem of lack of credit. Anybody who wants credit, notice this statement here, uh, there's no... Ex those, those who could not express demand because of a lack of credit are now unable to do so. There's no problem about, no reason why credit can't grow at the moment. And so the question is, why is growth anemic in the absence of major financial concerns? There are no financial problems anymore. Uh, and he said, therefore you'd expect in this situation, you'd expect interest rates to fall and you therefore get back to full employment. That should have happened if the conventional understanding they have of the economy actually work. But that, of course, requires flexible interest rates, and with rates being at zero, they, they can't go down to bring us back to that uh, lovely state of equilibrium. Now, I've emphasised his argument that finance is no longer a problem. So when you take a look at the data, you can clearly tell there's nothing in the data that might indicate to either Hansen when he spoke or Summers when he speaks now, that finance might be a problem. Okay. I can't see any correlation or coincidence between when Hansen was speaking back in the 1930s and when Summers speaking now. Can you? Okay. You don't look at that data, do you? We know it doesn't matter, therefore why look at it? There's a fair bit of irony in this presentation, because I don't think it deserves to be treated seriously, but the mainstream view. Now back to this ferrier concept, which you'll find peppered all the way through um, Summer's talk, and I think you'll find that this is unfortunately something which new PhD graduates from universities around the world will be trying to estimate and measure, and it'll become part of econometric packages and, and visions of the central banks uh, hopefully not Poland Central Bank, to try to explain why the crisis continues. So he says, here we go, a variety of structural changes suggest that ferrier levels, this is now a really important concept, have declined substantially. Slower population growth and technological growth. Again, the same explanations that Hansen dragged out in the 1930s, ignoring credit to explain the crisis. 
And what's the cure for ferrier? Well, you need some exogenous event. Because again, because ferrier is something that's not affected by the economy, it's <coughs> technological change and population growth. So we need something to raise spending or lower saving. Uh, or maybe we just have to have a decline overall and we then have a slump. And ferrier might rise, but we'll have a, a low level of output. So obviously ferrier is an extremely important concept. Okay? Really matters. So what precisely is ferrier? Well, I can tell you that it's been recently discovered by MIT's CERN laboratory. Now, you'd all know of CERN as the particle accelerator on the Swiss and French borders. I'm not talking about that CERN. This CERN stands for Crazy Economic Rationalizations of Anomalies. <laughs> and the ferry in the, the modeling the system that they use, which is called a, uh, a, a uh, what do they call it? It's a... Uh, Sub-economic particle equilibrator, the semi. Okay. They used to use the thing called SLIM, which is the ISLM model. Now they use one called DESIGN, which is a DSGE model, to equilibrate particles. And what it turns out, the ferrier is an anti-particle to a NARU. We all know about a NARU, that was the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Well, ferrier is the anti-particle to that, the negative of the NARU. And it turns out that a ferrier is created when a Nauru collides with a global financial crisis. Now, of course, this can't actually happen inside the particle equilibrator that they use because there is no such thing as a global financial crisis inside a standard neoclassical equilibrium system. So it must have come from the outside world, some parallel universe, or maybe even orthogonal universe called the real world. <laughs> it just turns up. And the collision of a global financial crisis with a Nehru causes the Nehru to disappear, and in its place you get a, a two particles. One is called a ZLB, a zero lower bound, and the other is a ferrier. And then the interaction of the two sustain each other, so the Z as ZLB lives much longer than they thought it would live, they'll expect that the ZLB to give way to a uh, NRE, which is a natural rate of interest, an RI, pardon me, but that, that hasn't happened, and they couldn't quite understand why. But now they finally can understand it because they've invented the ferrier as, a, as, a, as a, a companion particle to the ZLB that sustains the ZLB. And the real problem for them with the ZLB is that once it's there, all the other fundamental particles of their system turn upside down. So growth, which used to be high, is now low. Inflation, which was bad and everywhere, is now good and nowhere, and they're trying to cause it. <laughs> Central banks, CBs, that tried to prevent inflation, now try to cause inflation. And finally, HMDs, which are helicopter money drops, drops, which were a stupid idea, are now a good one. So they're turning upside down trying to explain all this stuff. Well, by the way, CERN uh, has been reported to a, a, a serious United Nations organisation called COCO, which is the campaign to outlaw contrived and outrageous acronyms. <laughs> so. Now... There's no empirical data that might have identified to the neoclassicals that there's something other than secular stagnation. You know, slack engineers and, and uh, parents who don't want to have children that might have caused the crisis. Maybe a credit particle might have been a bit. There's nothing really in the data that might indicate that credit and unemployment have any relationship with each other. I've turned unemployment upside down there to make the correlation less obvious. Okay? It's a mere minus 0.93. So you can ignore that. Credit clearly plays no role. When you look at that data, obviously the importance for credit. And if you take a look at the uh, Hansons, back in Hansons' day, well, he didn't have anything to tell him either. <coughs> Blind spots in this theoretical approach are just stunning, phenomenal. And um, taking a look at the change in credit, and the change in unemployment, again, no obvious correlation there, is there? It's only 0.88 between change in credit and the level of employment. Obviously worth ignoring. So the blind spots they create are simply phenomenal. And it's about time we gave them the ridicule they deserve for this and pull apart their theories and see why do they ignore something which, when you even consider that it might be worth looking at, screams at you that this is extremely important. This is really the explanation. Well, the reason they don't even look at credit to begin with is one of their many a priori notions about the economy that 
lending doesn't matter because lending is simply a transfer of spending power between one person and another, the loanable funds model. And this is Krugman, uh, one of the main supporters of this nonsense theory, um, ridiculing anybody who comes along with a realistic one. But his argument is that lending is simply a transfer from patient people to impatient people. It doesn't create money and there's no relationship between change in debt or credit and the level of the money supply, none whatsoever. And that is nonsense, and the Bank of England recently has come out with a beautiful paper to argue strongly in favour of the post-Kansian position that money is created by lending and credit is therefore very, very important, but they haven't quite put together the theoretical <coughs> argument yet. But even in post-Kansian economics, which of course is inheriting the tradition very largely from Pulaski, many, in many ways more so than Keynes, in terms of a practical implementation, uh, but in post-Kansian economics, there still is not an accepted role for credit either. And this comes down to the emphasis in post-Kansian economics upon being stock flow consistent, which of course is extremely important. But sometimes that can create a bit of a blind spot as well, and I believe it has here. And I'm quoting here Randall Ray in the opening to what they call the primer on modern monetary theory uh, on their blog site. And he says that you, that you begin from the simple macro accounting starting from the recognition that at the aggregate level, spending equals income. That spending is identical to income. And when I've been trying to argue for a role for credit, and I certainly have made some confusing statements of that, trying to get this, trying to work out how you can bring them in. Uh, but one uh, critic said that I'm arguing for a difference between expenditure and income to argue for a role for credit. Now, in, in some ways, I think I've been involved in a form of Keynes' cir um, circus, as it used to be called, in public rather than behind closed doors in Cambridge. So I have some of what I've said, which is developing towards a sensible explanation, but not being quite right there, is out in the public arena, so I'm stuck with that. But in this debate that I've had with um, Mark Lavoy and Brett Furby, Feiberger and a few others, Brett Feiberger's argument was that I effectively I'm contradicted by the proposition that expenditure is identically equal to income. Now I thought, well, it's true, that expenditure is identically equal to income. So if I'm right about credit also having a role, I should be able to prove that using the identity of expenditure and income. So this is more recent work, I haven't yet published it, uh, hopefully get that done uh, later on this year, but what I thought of doing is saying, well, let's actually draw up a table that shows expenditure and income in a multi-sectoral economy and then see whether I can find a role for credit in that. So what I'm going to do is divide the economy into three non-bank sectors plus a banking sector. And the spending and the expenditure and the income is going to be shown on the one table. And aggregate expenditure is going to be on the diagonal of the matrix I'll show you in a moment. Aggregate income is the sum of the off-diagonal elements. And I'm showing all flows in terms of dollars per year using lowercase Roman letters for them. And the stocks, and there's only one stock that turns up here, which is the level of debt, in an uppercase letter. And because I'm using lowercase Roman for uh, the flows in dollars per year, I'm going to use rho for the interest rate. And the first case I want to look at is where neither lending nor borrowing ha happens at all. It's the the saves the law type of world. So this is the table, and what I have there, I'll have three sectors. So this is uh, sector one, sector two, sector three for the non-bank, the, and the bank having two entries, one for its equity and the other for the assets of the, of the bank. And this is the, the horizontal shows the expenditure by each sector as well. So I'm having sector one spending the amounts of A dollars per year and B dollars per year buying goods from sector two and sector three. And the same sector two spending C and plus D dollars per year buying goods from sector one and sector three, and so on. So when you look at it, it's fairly obvious. The negative of the sum of the diagonals gives you aggregate expenditure. And that's what it is, A plus, per, these are dollars per year. Now the off-diagonal elements are identical. They have to be. So that's ensuring the identity of expenditure and income. And they're also equal to A plus B R to F. So that's the basic case we all start from, that expenditure is identically equal to income. Now what about if we look at the, the neoclassical model of loanable funds? 
Well, intriguingly, it's, sometimes you, you get a surprise when you put things in a logical format. Because I thought I'd find that, uh, yeah, logic does strange things. Neoclassicals should try logic one of these days. Rather than the, I, I talk about neoclassical economists not practicing mathematics, by the way. They practice what I call mythematics. <laughs> They've got a set of notions they wish to reach, and they find a way of getting there either by dreaming up nonsense concepts to begin with, or by ignoring the mathematical logic that falls out when they try to derive it in a serious fashion. But here we're going to have sector one borrowing L dollars per year from sector two. And therefore, sector two not spending that L dollars per year on the other two sectors. It may well modify what it does spend. There can be feedbacks, okay? But I'm simply showing that there's a flow of lending from sector two to sector one. Now, of course, if there's a flow of lending, there must be an outstanding stock of debt. So, to, and the reason sector two is lending for one, for sector one is to get interest payments for that lending. So there's an additional flow that turns up of rho times L dollars per, uh, per year, capital L, as well as the L dollars per year being borrowed by sector one, and then part of what it then spends on sector, sector two. And I'm showing in a very simple way. I have sector one, two lends L dollars per year to sector one, so sector one has L dollars per, per year more to spend, and sector one also has an obligation to pay interest on the outstanding debt of row times capital dollars per year. And then sector one is spending all that flow on sector three, and, spend, and of course the payments have to go to sector two. And of course that's a stylized instance, just to make the, put less terms on the table, I could make it much more comprehensive, it would still be the same fundamental logic coming out of this. So now you look at the, the aggregate expenditure, it now has a term of L, the flow in dollars per year of new loans, and rho times capital L as the interest payments. But you'll notice fairly obviously the, the two flows cancel out. Okay. But what's left are the interest payments. They turn up as part of aggregate expenditure, and they're also part of aggregate income. And of course, if I include deposit payments as well, which I'm not doing, interest on deposits, they would also turn up there as part of aggregate expenditure. Now, what about the real world? Let's go across outside uh, MIT's CERN and look at the real world. Well, here we have endogenous money. So, rather than borrowing from a non-bank, which is what the neoclassicals model, the sector one is borrowing from a banking sector. So, there's now a flow of, of new debt in L dollars per year, and an outstanding stock of debt as well in the banking sector, which the borrower has to pay to the equity account of the banking sector. So I'm now including the banking, banking equity inside there, and I'm now showing two elements about the loans. I'm showing the stock of loans here, and the flow of new loans in dollars per year over here. Okay. So these flows, all the, this five, these five cells are all flows, this one is a stock. But what I want to look at now is what's happening in these, this 4x4 four four element here. That's expenditure and income. So here we have expenditure. And now, of course, there's no offsetting minus L, little l, to the plus L of flow of new loans. That's the endogenous creation of money going on. When you sum that up, you find that both aggregate expenditure includes both the flow of new loans, which is credit, and interest on the outstanding level of debt. And the same thing applies for aggregate, expend, aggregate income. That includes the flow of new, de new debt, which is credit, and the interest on outstanding debt, gross tri financial transactions. So there is a role for the change in debt in aggregate expenditure and aggregate income. And the simple way to think about this is if you go out for a drink tonight and you buy a bottle of wine using your credit card, when you swipe that credit card, you create additional debt for yourself and additional expenditure because you buy the bottle of wine and additional income because that purchase then becomes part of the income of the, of the, of the hotel you've gone to. So it's quite simple. It all happens that way. The difference when you see endogenous money versus loanable funds is there's no person who has to spend less because you've spent more. It's been new money being created. So new money, new expenditure, and new income all at once. And it's quite simple. Once you put it together, it's actually very, very 
simple argument. So we now have to think about expenditure and income in a strictly monetary way, because I think a large part of why we didn't see this is, even though we have a, we've, we're not orthodox economists, we've been infected with the neoclassical vision of seeing things in real terms, when real itself is an abstraction. Real is not real. Money is real. And we've locked it out of our thinking. So thinking in a strictly monetary way, expenditure is monetary, and there are two sources of expenditure, either the turnover of existing money, or the creation of new money financed by debt. And those are the two sources of expenditure. And you can add them up to get total expenditure. And there will also be total income plus total realised capital gains. Now, how do you measure this? Well, again, I think part of the conventional practice of post-Keynesian economists has blinded them about this because post-Keynesian economists tend to think in what they call period analysis. But this is not one thing I can accuse Koleski of, thank God. Koleski was well trained with engineering and works in continuous time. I don't, does Koleski have anything where he uses different equations? I don't think he does. Well, he, he did in the first essay on, on his cycle. Right. Not, he went over, and I think we have to take that lead. Yeah. Continuous time is the way to think about yeah. a capitalist system. Not because it's a, a smooth system, but because all the transactions of consumption, uh, investment, government spending, etc., etc., are asynchronous. Okay. Yes, each, each spending act is discreet, but your investment and your consumption are not coordinated with somebody else's investment and some other firm's consumption. So with that massively disaggregated asynchronous process at the micro level, the best way to model it at the macro level is using continuous time. And that's the insight that Koleski had from being trained as an engineer. So when people, when economists, mainstream, when post-Keynesian economists look at GDP, their reflex is to say, well, it comes out in discrete quarterly data, so we should use dis discrete time in years or quarters to model the economy. I think that's fundamentally wrong. What we have with GDP is a very, very poor measure of the flow of expenditure in dollars per year at a point in time. About question of this money, but, uh, yeah. could you explain this indigen indigenous money yeah. in, in contrast to what kind, another kind of money, perhaps, in order to get the, to grasp? Well, the, the endogenous money is simply saying that the banks, when banks lend money, they are not lending a stock of money that they have saved to you. They are simply recording on the asset side of their ledger a new debt, and on the liability side, a new deposit which for a bank is, is a liability. So that is a we, that creates a debt and creates money at the same time, which is what the banks actually do. That's the real world. The neoclassical vision is to say that lending is from one non-bank agent to another non-bank agent. As a non-bank, the only way you can have money is you've saved it. Okay? And then when you make the transfer, you're, to, to lend somebody to somebody else, your money stock has to fall and their money stock rises. So that's that's the neoclassical vision of loanable funds. It's simply empirically false. It's empirically and institutionally not what happens. You know, you, some people in this room will lend somebody else some money to go shopping today, perhaps, but the majority of people who access loans in this room and in the world will do it by getting a loan from a bank. And that bank creates the money by double entry bookkeeping. It's okay, not. so thank you. Because before that explanation, I was thinking that indigenous money were yeah. a kind of money. Well, let's say 19th century Germany and Russia, for example. Russia is taking money and not having enough developed banking system. Russia, let's say, Vita time, yes, mm -hmm. it, it, it takes money from France, yeah, but uh, that doesn't have produ produces internally from agriculture, they own money. So I was thinking in that term. But the Germany has advanced uh, uh, industrialization going. So Germany has Dresdner Bank, Deutsche Bank, and so better. So, uh, but the, the rest, uh, Germany is not lending Russia. Yes. So no, I was no, thinking it's, instead, it's, it's, this instead, this endogenous money was uh, in relation to banking system and it's, the, it's inside uh, one national system. Okay. Okay. You're, 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 you're talking about lending from a one so inside one, to one one economy. Rather. One economy. Yeah. 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 So we, we have a flow. Of, out of yeah. 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 
we have, printing money. And I can illustrate that. I work, we can illustrate that later in my talk, if you like, with my software package, Minsky. So GDP is a very poor measure of a continuous flow. So today dollars are the indigenous money? Today uh, dollars. The do dollars of today are indigenous money or not? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. So you have GDP as a measure of a flow of expenditure in dollars per year at a point in time. And change in debt, which we record rather better than we do GDP, is a flow of, new, of credit created by new debt in dollars per year. And it's dimensionally accurate to add the two together. One is the turnover of existing money as a source of demand and income. The other is new money as a source of demand and income. Now, I'll give you an analogy here. It's a bit like trying to measure the flow on a river where there's also a pump at some one point in the river that can either pump water in or pump water out of the, of the river. And this is actually this is an illustration from the floods in the north, the north of England uh, earlier this year. And clearly, to measure the flow on the river after that pump goes past, you need to include the flow of the river plus the flow in or out from the pump. In the same sense, GDP is like the flow of new of exist, turnover of existing money, and the pump is like credit going into the system. So the sum of the two is a very accurate measure for total expenditure and total income plus realised capital gains, because most of the borrowed money these days is borrowed to buy assets rather than goods and services. So I add GDP to change in debt, which I call credit. So change in debt is credit. And when you find the peak of this cease too, you can identify every crisis that's occurred in the, last, in, in the history of capitalism with good enough data. So the sum of the two is total expenditure and therefore total income. And here I'm looking at the situation in Japan, the mystery of why Japan has been in stagnation for 25 years. Yes, Japanese parents are having less children. Uh, yes, Japanese technology is not advancing quite as rapidly. But the real turning point is identified by adding GDP to credit, and you find that is the peak, which is in 1990, March of 1990. And from that point on, total demand in the economy has never returned to the levels it had back in, those, in 1990. That's why Japan's economy came to a screaming halt. Now, the red line is GDP, the blue line is GDP plus credit, plus credit. And then the black line, which is measured on the right-hand axis here, is credit as a percentage of GDP. And you can see that credit as a percentage of GDP peaked just before the turnaround, largely because the, the, the prices occurred slightly later because GDP was still growing at that point. So you can identify the crisis by finding when credit, the rate of, growth, the rate of growth of debt slows down. And then from 2000, from 1998 on roughly, credit's been mainly negative, taking demand out of the economy rather than adding it to it. So that's the situation for, Ch for Japan. And when you look at credit as a percentage of GDP <coughs> for the previous five years, you find that it was 18%. Okay. Enormous stimulus over and above the turnover of existing money. Since the crisis, the average has been minus 1.8% of GDP. What about the Japanese bank at that time in comparison to other banks in the world? They have a lot of money, as I remember. They were creating it by double Okay, they were, so it's flooding. they were very big, big inflation, it was, or what it was? No, it wasn't no, no, inflation, no, no. but they, 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 were, they were nine of the world's ten biggest banks were Japanese. Okay, they the were very big banks at that time. Only because they created a lot of money, not because they were... But measure only... To, but well, could, could I suggest that we have questions yes, right after the presentation, yeah. okay? Thank you. Uh, Steve, yeah. just about another five minutes. We need to go to other oh, okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. This is USA. Same sort of story. And of course, given the time, I'll, I'll, I'll jump over a few slides here. Um, so I want to just show a bit of the logic behind this because it's possible to use this argument to identify countries that are going to have a crisis in the future. And China is obviously the most important one that's going to have a crisis. <coughs> so I apply the same logic to China and find that China is currently having credit being equivalent to 25% of GDP. So when that slows down, we're going to see an enormous slump. And I've got three possibilities here. What if China's debt, debt ratio continues growing at its current rate? Then it will grow roughly the same rate it has this year. 
which is about 8% of J 8% per annum. If credit slows down so that the debt ratio stabilizes, so debt still grows but at the same rate as GDP, demand in China will fall by 5%. If China's debt level stabilizes, so there's no change in debt between this year and next, there'll be a 16% fall in demand in China. So that's the reason why it matters so much. When you have a high level of debt and credit's a major source of demand in the economy, you will have a slump if credit simply slows down. It doesn't have to go negative. Okay. Of course, it does go negative when you take a look at it empirically. So that's the problem we face. Now, I want to just uh, quickly illustrate an, uh, how can you model this type of process? How can you actually capture this uh, empirically? And again, neoclassical economics has misled us by saying we have to work from the individual agent up to model the economy. Describe a rational firm, describe a rational uh, a consumer, extrapolate their behaviour to the aggregate level, and then you have a model of the macroeconomy. That's nonsense. Okay. It's bad logically, it's been disproved mathematically by neoclassical economists. But we need another way of approaching it, and my proposition is what, in fact, has been the practice for post-Keynesian economists has been to take real-world definitions at the macro level and work from identities, work from the macro level down. So I have a model of Minsky which I can pretty much explain by saying Take the employment rate, which is the number of workers with a job divided by population. Take the wage share, which is wages divided by GDP. And take the private debt ratio, which is debt divided by GDP. And differentiate them with respect to time. That's all you have to do. And what you get is three expressions, which are logically absolutely true. Employment will rise, the employment level will rise, if economic growth exceeds the sum of labour productivity, change and population growth. And ditto for wage share, a similar expression there. And the debt ratio will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. So they're still working completely, absolutely true statements. Now, when you put those together and use an incredibly simple set of assumptions, so I'm simply assuming relationships everywhere. A linear Phillips curve, a linear response by capitalists to the rate of profit in terms of how much they wish to invest, and all debt being borrowed simply to for productive reasons rather than speculation. You put that together, this is the simplest linear system I get, and what you get is slightly scary to people aren't used to mathematics, uh, but there's a set of three nonlinear differential equations there. And the nonlinearities come out of interactions between the variables. So the first one has the employment rate multiplied by uh, wages share of output and the debt ratio. The second has the wages uh, share of output divided multiplied by the employment rate, and the third has the debt level multiplied by wages share and then also by the debt level. Now, what that gives you is a system with fundamental nonlinearities and it has two possible outcomes. The first is it can converge to a good equilibrium with a positive employment rate, a positive wages share, and a finite ratio of debt to GDP. And when you put that in three dimensions, you get an obvious conversion process going on. It looks fine. And that's what neoclassicals see happening everywhere, of course. The bad equilibrium has a similar shape, but it converges to a bad outcome of zero employment, zero wage share, and an infinite debt ratio. But what you see initially is a convergence. The great moderation turns up as part of this model. It's not a separate phenomenon. It's part of the same dynamic process. This is wages share, and the debt ratio does not stabilise. You put those two together, or three together, and this is the shape you get. So you get an apparent great moderation before a crisis. Now, this is actually, again, if I had more time, I'd go through the logic. It's called the Fermat Manneville route to chaos, or the intermittent route to chaos, first discovered in fluid dynamics. So you have a process which, if what's called a Poincaré map here, if the line and the curve intersect with each other and you have a process bouncing between the two, then the bottom equilibrium will be stable. You'll bounce and you'll, you'll head from turbulent flow in water to smooth flow in water. But they found that when the line is not tangential, you have apparent convergence, turbulence seems to give way to smooth flow, and then you have turbulence on the other side. So that's the phenomenon that identified here, it's very similar to what we found 
in fluid dynamics about 40 years ago. Now, a few other things which I could cover in more detail. One of the most important being the wager share of output is the residual in this system. So even though I have the firms doing the borrowing, it's the workers who pay for it in terms of a lower income share of GDP. So this model also predicts if you have rising inequality, you're heading towards a crisis. It's a reason, empirical reason, to be worried about rising inequality. Not because inequality is nasty and bad, but because it's a prelude to a serious economic crisis, which is what we've been through. And yeah, again, this is rather more complicated. Again, if I had more time, I'd, I'd cover it in more detail. But a high level of desire to invest in this model results in a lower growth rate because it gives you a much higher debt ratio. And therefore, capitalists end up with less money to invest. So there are a whole lot of paradoxes that turn up which are very hard to understand from a neoclassical point of view, very straightforward from a nonlinear dynamics point of view, which is the approach that Koleski took to his work as well. And uh, when I whack it into including, uh, that was a model without prices. When I include prices, I get a slightly scarier set of equations. It's not all that complicated from a mathematics point of view. And I won't try to explain that, but I will show you it running <laughs> in the Minsky software that I've designed, uh, which is based on system dynamics, which is an area from engineering that economists should also learn. And, uh, not, not so much Koleski, but Bill Phillips was trying to get economists to use this type of system. And if I simulate this model, then you get a process, this is the employment rate down here, which looks like you're going through the 1950s and 60s of stability, then the 70s and 80s of increasing volatility, and finally it looks like you've reached the 2000 period of stability, And then without warning, the economy collapses. Because what you've been ignoring, if you're a mainstream economist, the rising level of debt to GDP, means that falling income share to workers is more than offset by rising share going to bankers. So ultimately, capitalists who thought everything was wonderful suddenly find their profit rate collapsing and the economy goes into a permanent slump. That's fairly, not particularly hard to build a model like that. I'll Again, with more time, I'll, I'll take you through more of the detail behind a, a system like that. So what we're suffering from is not secular stagnation, it's credit stagnation. That's what we need to understand. And the neoclassicals are the main reason we can't, we don't understand it. The sooner we get rid of that mythical approach to economics, the better. And looking at it historically, again, back to that chart I showed you earlier, Summers, was, Summers is as wrong today as Hansen was then because they both ignored the role of credit in capitalism. Thank you. Well, should we take some questions and answers? Yeah. Uh, okay, we'll have a short uh, time for questions and answers. If anyone wants to, to raise a point, please introduce yourself and try to be brief. Yes, my name is yes. Michael Derrick. From Switzerland. One of those always fails. <laughs> Hello. That's my name is Michael Dare uh, from Switzerland, Lutheran University of Applied Sciences and Arts. Um, I'd like to ask you what you think of uh, plain money, of this uh, uh, proposal to to uh, eliminate this indigenous, uh, indigenous money that banks create. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually on the uh, advisory panel of positive money, which is one of the groups we're proposing. Yeah. Uh, and I have a lot of time for the people in that group. Uh, thank you. Um, so, but my problem about having only government money creation is um, government bureaucrats are just as likely to stuff up as bankers only in different ways at different times. And I think you need credit being created by capitalist banks to fund investors and entrepreneurs, not to fund speculators. So I'd rather redesign the system so there was a role for private lending to lend to entrepreneurs and the government money creation for infrastructure and social services, a combination like that. So. Um, so definitely they, they are right about the failings of the private credit system, but I think it's more 
the private credit system creates money to fund speculation. That's the major problem. Next one. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, according to the models you've just presented, it seems that uh, one of the results of one of the conclusions of your speech is that uh, we, uh, the regulation wasn't a very good idea, especially in the terms of financial markets. Yeah. The question is, uh, if we cannot trust the markets to um, rule themselves, should we trust the uh, administrators, the regulators and the politicians to do the same? And that's the question about the positive money as, as yeah. uh, sovereign money and so on. Again, on the same front, I think um, we will have failings on both sides. Um, if you had, for example, if you had a, you gave the government the responsibility for money creation right now and you had an neoclassical economist in charge, they'd be trying to produce as little money as possible. We'd be in permanent stagnation. So you, you need a, a, a very wise government. <laughs> I think that's almost an oxymoron. <laughs> OK, yes. And this is the last question, please. The mic goes Hi, um, my name is Ekaj Szczerem. I'm from the Polish Mises Institute. And I would like to ask you, do you see any links between your approach or the Pope's approach mm -hmm. and the Austrian School of Economics? Uh, since, as far as I know, uh, Austrians um, always uh, used to focus on the credit, uh, mm -hmm. the, the credit creation, yeah. and so on. To, to it. The Austrians still base themselves on a, on a utilitarian theory of value. And I think that's just a, a, a wrong foundation of modeling capitalism. And they take the neoclassical framework as correct, but overemphasizing equilibrium. It's wrong and overemphasizes equilibrium. So I think we've got a bad starting foundation. They have got a much stronger focus on credit, which is good again. But again, a lot of what they blame for the problems, they say, is due to fractional reserve banking, which is a myth. So the, there are elements of, of sense to what they argue, and particularly in, in terms of money and the role of markets in terms of information distribution and the disequilibrium strengths of capitalism. It's all very valid. But they're working from the wrong theoretical foundation, which is utilitarian views, and they have a naive view of what would happen if you went back to private, private money as if everything would be fine with private banks. I think what we've seen is a sign that private banks can be very bad and we'd have just as much instability with this pure private banking system as we would have stagnation with the pure government system. Okay, well, there is uh, there one comment which relates to the question that was raised during your presentation. Yeah. And this is, uh, the question was whether the US uh, uh, dollar notes uh, are version of money. And I think, should we take into account that the endogenous money that we talk about is mainly credit regarding notes is the Federal Reserve System, which as any central bank is the only institution which has the right to print money. So in this sense, uh, the, the, the notes are not quite endogenous money. Okay? Yeah. In difference to the main part of endogenous money, which is credit money. But for and the world, this is for totally, the world. And this is, of course, supplied by, by, by banking and, and quasi-banking institutions nowadays. Uh, I understand you, you, you agree. Oh, uh, yes, absolutely, okay. yeah. OK, yeah. well, mm -hmm. now, before you go, and we thank you before we do that for, for your excellent presentation, uh, I have a parish announcement that I would like to, to be made by Professor Planks, uh, which relates to your uh, Monday presentation in the bank, because for clear reasons, I couldn't offer you as much time as you would yeah. be offered on Monday, and he will give information to any in the audience who would be willing and able to attend your, your, your lecture at the Polish Central Bank, uh, and, and then the discussion of questions could be uh, uh, continued uh, on Monday. Thank uh, you. Uh, good afternoon. Well, let me confirm. This is true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the place is the hour. And the place will be the National Bank of Poland. The National Bank of Poland, the headquarters, the Świętokrzyska Street. We start at 10 o'clock. The uh, entrance is free. 
so anyone can come. Uh, and I think we'll have more time for discussion, and the seminar will last at least one hour and a half. Well, thank you. So, <laughs> no problem. <laughs>